Hey everybody, Tom Cherry Holmes here with the FujiNet project. And I want to show you guys just how easy it is to program new network applications with the FujiNet using nothing more than an Atari, a FujiNet device, and a copy of Atari Basic with the N handler loaded via Auto Run Sys. In fact, if you want to take and follow along, you can actually do so by mounting atariapps.arata.online onto a host slot, going to the nHandler folder, selecting the nHandler ATR, mounting it to drive one, and booting a copy of it. The auto run sys that's on this disk can be copied to any DOS disk that you wish so that you can write your own programs as well. We'll go ahead and boot in, and you'll see that the auto run sys adds a banner to the top indicating that FujiNet is now ready and we can now use the end device. What can we do with this end device? For that, we are actually going to need to set up a little terminal window over here on my PC and view it. Pardon me there. And we're going to open up a copy of Netcat to listen for a network connection on port 6502. Once this is done, we can then go ahead and dimension a variable for our input here, which we'll use in just a moment, and go ahead and open up a connection to our host. Now the open command may look familiar to most of you. In fact, the only things that are maybe different are the aux2 value and the string of characters after a device spec here. The aux2 value here specifies a translation value, which specifies whether or not carriage returns, line feeds, or both are translated to Itasky EOL characters and back again. And in fact, there are four different values. If you use zero, then no translation is performed at all. If you use one, then carriage returns are translated to EOLs. If you use two, then line feeds are translated to EOLs. And if you use three, then carriage returns and line feeds are translated to EOLs and spaces. We'll go ahead and use two since I'm on a Unix machine here and open up the socket. We'll see here, you'll tell by the sounds that it wrote the command to the FujiNet. The FujiNet completed the command and acknowledged that everything was okay. So we wound up with a nice little ready prompt here. At this point, we can do any input and output to the socket that we wish using standard IO commands. Writing to the socket is very easy. We can simply take and use the print number one command here. Write out strings with impunity. Conversely, we can also take and send information back from the PC. And get it using the input command. You can see right there, that is how easy it is to, trans to, to literally transmit data from one host to the Atari and back again using nothing more than standard I.O. commands walking out to the internet. Let's put this to good use. We'll do this by writing a simple little terminal program here in BASIC. We'll go ahead and close this connection out, and you'll see that closing this connection actually closes Netcat here and brings it back to the shell. We're done with this for now, so we'll go ahead and just kind of put this to the side. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring up my notes here for my terminal program here. And we'll start writing this. We start making a new program 
And the first thing we do is we go ahead and open up a socket to bbs.fostex.net. Since bbsfostex.net sends carriage returns and line feeds, we need to accommodate for that, so we do that in the open statement. We also open up an additional, uh, an additional IOCB to the keyboard to handle keyboard input. We go ahead and trap for line 140 to catch any eventual errors that may result. And then we immediately start to try and scan the keyboard. If we get anything from the keyboard, we grab it. and then put it out to the socket and flush the output buffer. This ensures that the character will go out exactly when we type something at the keyboard, as is expected for a terminal program. We then check the status of the input device. In the case of the end device, if we do a status, we get back four bytes. Two of those bytes, the first two, are the number of bytes waiting in the receive buffer. Since this is a 16-bit value, we actually need to take and do a little transformation on them and turn them into a nice single value. If the number of bytes waiting is zero, then we don't need to do anything. And we can go all the way back to 110. Otherwise, we go ahead and loop through the number of bytes waiting, and for each one of them, we grab it, put it in C, then immediately output it to the screen. Put number 16 is the same as basically uh, putting to IOCB number 0, but since you can't reference IOCB number 0 from BASIC, number 16 will actually get you the same result. We'll go ahead, finally, and uh, once that's done, we take and go back and immediately start scanning the keyboard again. 140 is where we trapped before, and it's basically go, said, okay, if something goes wrong, then we close the connection, we indicate that we've con disconnected from the connection, and we end the program. That is everything that we need to do to make a usable terminal program. Let's test it. We can see right here that it just works out of the box. Nothing special. I mean, it's literally, it's nothing but basic, and yet it works just fine. It's not the most efficient code, but it is hopefully a good example to show you how simple it actually is to make something like a raw terminal program inside Atari BASIC on the FujiNet. We'll go ahead and loop through this, get to the main menu, and we're not really going to do anything, but we're just going to take and log out immediately once we reach the main menu. Okay, so we're done. Log off. Yes, go ahead and log off. And now that we're done, we can go ahead and hit the break key here and close the connection. That's it. Bam. There you go. Fully functional, uh, raw uh, terminal program. No telnet or anything that adds to the complexity. And of course, one can argue that we can take and make a protocol adapter for the FujiNet to handle the telnet IAC escape sequences, etc. But I wanted to do it this way to basically just prove the point. But that's really not all. You see, this end device exposes a wide variety of protocols in exactly the same manner, using exactly the same conventions. This is very important and very powerful. We can, for example, go to ICANHASIP.com, which has a nice little HTTP uh, 
little serving connection that sends back a public IP that I'm from. All I did was change the URL. That's it, boom. And suddenly, this program is transformed from Telnet, or Netcat in this case, to WGET. Voila. And to show you that it actually is HTTP, we'll do one final, one, one final HTTP test here and go to fujinet.pl. Uh, let me the screen. And we'll see, whoop, is it gonna let me do this? Eh. Come on, really? Darn it, okay, darn, okay. Uh, such is such the way of demos here, but hopefully you guys got the point across. We'll go ahead and close the connection here. But the end device can actually do a lot more than that. For example, since this is a standard CIO device, I have blackjack.basic sitting on this web server. And we can load it, or at least, darn it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Apologies for that. But you can see, yeah, still working on the program here, still bugs to work out. But you can see that it actually fetched a copy of Blackjack from the web server and loaded it into Atari Basic. Worked, bam, there we go. And then some. I hope this really drives home the point of how powerful uh, this FujiNet device is, not just for emulating existing devices, the disk drive, the virtual printer, the speech synthesizer, etc., but the end device and the SIO functions underneath the end device open up a world of possibilities for writing new network applications. Not only can you use these uh, networking functions through the in handler, you can also talk to the SIO devices directly. And for high level languages like Pascal or C or Action, this may actually be more preferable. So with that, uh, I'm going to end the demonstration here. I hope you guys really enjoyed this. And um, until next time. Have fun.